Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Typically, the board election for the electric co-op in rural West Central Indiana doesn't draw a lot of interest. But this year, people who've never voted have it marked on their calendars. One day out of the year, you have to drive 100 miles round trip to vote. Coming up more on the controversy that's driving people to the polls. Plus, is a convenience store that found a legal loophole going to be allowed to continue selling cold beer? The latest on that situation in our State House segment. We'll visit Bosma Enterprises where they offer training and employment opportunities for the blind. It's really important when someone's adjusting to their vision loss that they don't think of themselves as, I'm just this blind person. Coming up, we'll show you the latest technology. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Rural electric cooperatives operate differently than other utilities because they're member owned. There's no state oversight like with public utility companies. Ratepayers are, are the members and they elect a board of directors that, among other things, hire and fire the CEO who leads the organization. It's set up as a democracy with annual elections. Now, each of the eight directors serves a three year term. In the south central part of the state, ratepayers at the Utilities District of Western Indi Indiana will vote tomorrow. And as Sarah Whitmire reports, all of the seats up for election are contested. Valerie Savage lives about 15 miles west of Bloomington city limits in Porter Ridge. It's the perfect place for her. She's got room for her horses to graze and her dog can run freely. It'll be 40 years this summer since she moved here. So for 40 years, she's gotten her electricity from UDWI. Tomorrow will be the first time though that she's ever voted in a board election. My impulse is to, and this is always dangerous, is to vote uh, against the incumbents just because something needs to change. <laughs> but that's kind of voting in ignorance, so I kind of hate to do that too. Savage is upset. Like most people, she's always opened her electric bill with a bit of dread and thought it was too much. But still, she was surprised to learn she's been paying more for electricity than anyone else in the state. Because that's the thing, out in the country, everybody's somewhat isolated. I mean, unless it's, you know, family members that you see regularly. I mean, I talk to my neighbors, but not on a regular basis, and usually it's not about the electric bill. Usually it's about, you know, sorry, my horses got out, or, you know, something like that. UDWI is one of 18 electric co-ops that buys its power from Hoosier Energy. But data from an investigation we published last month shows that UDWI customers pay more than members of any of those other co-ops, and their rate of 16.38 cents per kilowatt hour is among the highest in the Midwest. I just got tired of everybody saying every time the wind blew or a bird landed on the line and how oh, they were out of power. Were they complaining about their rates, about the how much they were paying, though? No, not the ones that was coming up and talking to me. As CEO, Brian Sparks handles the day-to-day -day management of the co-op and makes recommendations to the eight-member board of directors. One of the major responsibilities of the board is to establish the electric rate the cooperative charges its members. For several years, we, we have known that we're in the top, I would say, quartile 
of the uh, co-ops in the state uh, in, in terms of our rate. You know, there were some needs that, uh, that uh, we felt we had to address as a, as a co-op. Um, one of the most pressing ones was reliability. UDWI increased spending on tree clearing and brush removal by 74 percent from 2012 to 2015. The co-op also increased spending on poll tests and meters. All of the co-ops are not-for-profits, so any revenue above the cost of their expenses is supposed to be returned to the members, the ratepayers. UDWI's 2015 tax returns show out of $49 million in revenues for the year, it's allocated $5.6 million of excess earning to return to its members. Remember Valerie Savage, who's lived here since the 70s? She's never received a refund. That's because the co-op is just now paying out 1959 and 1960. I'm 68 almost, and 1959, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be alive if I, uh, and I don't have any heirs, and, you know, that was, Brian Sparks was, well, their heirs will get it. Well, okay, maybe, but after, you know, 1959, you know, how many heirs are going to be even still alive or in the area to look at this list of unclaimed, it, it's, to me, it's, it's just absurd. A billboard along the highway that runs in front of the UDWI office in Bloomfield urges voters to vote for change. The ballot includes three new names, Todd Carpenter, David Berger, and John Royal. They're challenging incumbents Jim Weimer, Jack Nost, and David Stone. Voting takes place at the group's annual meeting. The Harrison County REMC in the southern part of the state had its meeting this week. There was a band, games, a raffle, health screenings, and hundreds of people filled the middle school gym to get an update on the REMC and cast their ballots. They give away a lot of gifts, and uh, I like to attend it every year, see who's going to be on the board and one thing or another. I, I even like to go down when they have their bingo and that down there. That, that's a lot of fun deals. Most annual meetings look something like this, and with most of the REMCs in Indiana, you have to attend in order to vote in the annual election. They have a free meal if you get there in time, and they have a band, and they have a you know, health fair, and I mean, there's all this stuff, which quite frankly, that's all nice, I guess, if somebody wants to drive 50 or 100 miles, but I'd rather just stay home and get things done at home and be able to check a box and turn in my boat. Valerie Savage lives here in Porter Ridge. She wants to go vote at the annual meeting, but in order for her to do that, it's a 50 mile round trip. The UDWI district stretches north of Brazil to Odin at its southernmost point. So some people have to commute even twice as far as Savage. A handful of the REMCs allow online voting or voting by mail, and Savage wonders why UDWI can't include a ballot once a year with her monthly bill. Now, to me, that's not a very uh, member-friendly situation. And I guess the only conclusion I can come to is, well, maybe they really don't want you to vote. I mean, how, what are you supposed to think, you know? In your opinion, do you feel like this REMC is working like a, like a grand democracy? I do, because they got a chance to change it every year. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. The board positions are paid, and the UDWI board is one of the highest paid in the state. In 2015, Jim Weimer received just shy of $33,000 for a reported 14 hours of work per week. Some of the other directors make as much as $175 an hour. Todd Carpenter, who's running against Weimer, says he'd move to reduce salaries if he's elected. He's also vowing to increase transparency. And an unfortunate thing happened to Valerie Savage since we talked to her for this story. She's in the hospital, so now she won't be able to vote tomorrow. We talked to her on the phone, and she's going to be okay, but she says her current situation underscores her point that voting needs to be easier. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. 
ICE says it handed Indiana restaurant owner Roberto Barry Stein over to Mexican authorities this week. ICE officials arrested Barry Stein during a routine check-in in February. The agency took him into custody because Barry Stein failed to voluntarily deport himself more than 16 years ago. An attorney working as an advocate for his family says there is a pending motion that claims Barry Stein was classified incorrectly in 2000 as an alien present in the U.S. without inspection. He should have been described as an arriving alien. If he was described as a, an arriving alien, we wouldn't be in this current mess. Now, according to that attorney, Barry Stein was trying to fight his deportation through several legal avenues, and none of his attorneys were notified of his deportation. Some residents say they have concerns about construction of the final stretch of Interstate 69 that will run from Martinsville to Indianapolis. It will follow the existing route of State Road 37. At a public hearing last night, some people who spoke out say they, there aren't enough planned lanes or interchanges to handle the heavy traffic on Indianapolis's south side. It's pretty much a running joke the way the traffic travels north and south on the south side of Indianapolis. And even when 69 is finished, it's not going to improve the traffic flow. INDOT is hosting another meeting to get public feedback Monday in Martinsville. It will take all of the comments into consideration before making a final decision on Section 6 during the first quarter of next year. The state still has to secure funding for the project. Meanwhile, I-69 Section 5 is more than a year behind schedule. Kimberly Hively is the winner in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals ruling of a case challenging whether federal workplace discrimination laws cover sexual orientation. Hively filed a lawsuit claiming Ivy Tech Community College in South Bend didn't hire her full time because she's a lesbian. A legal expert says the ruling could signal a growing acceptance of the LGBT community. So there's something wrong when you have a fundamental right to get married, but then you can get fired because of the person that you married and because they're the same sex as you. Whitus says the issue is likely to land at the Supreme Court. Women in Indiana no longer have to wait at least 18 hours between an ultrasound and an abortion after a recent court ruling. Planned Parenthood sued the state over the 2016 law, and parts of it are now halted. U.S. District Judge Tanya Walton Pratt wrote in her ruling that Indiana's mandate creates significant financial and other burdens on the group and its patients, particularly low-income women. The court's decision demonstrated that this requirement has created serious problems for women trying to obtain abortions because of backlogs being caused in the few centers that are performing the ultrasound. In a statement, Indiana Right to Life calls the judge's ruling sadly predictable. Separate parts of last year's abortion law provisions banning abortions performed because of the fetus's characteristics and potential disability and requiring medical facilities to bury or cremate fetal remains were halted by a previous ruling. The historic West Baden Springs Hotel is shining a little brighter after a series of renovations this winter. When you step into the dome at night, the atrium lights up with all the colors of the rainbow. It used to be lit by 150,000 watts of incandescent lights, but now it's all LEDs. The colors are more vibrant, and the hotel is saving energy. It depends on how, what level we want to run them at. We can run it clear down to about 95% savings, uh, easily over 75% in energy savings. Guests can also now see a nightly virtual light show. It has new patterns and colors and can be synced to music. It's quite a sight to see. It's, it's beautiful. There have been a number of other improvements over the winter as well, including replacing 700 windows, all constructed to be historically accurate. A clay target shooting range is under construction, and the billiards and bowling alley building is being turned into a venue for weddings. The hotel is celebrating 10 years since its grand renovation project. Cook Group bought the hotel in the 90s and invested more than half a billion dollars to restore it to its original architecture. You know, we really feared that it was going to be lost forever. 
Um, and then the fact that we were able to restore it to its original elegance, and I think even beyond, um, you know, has really been a joy to people. There's something so special, Joe, just about sitting under that dome and how neat that it's right here in Indiana. You have to go see it, though. Yes. It's amazing. You have to get the chocolate dome when you're there. Ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We'll bring you the latest updates from the Indiana State House, including the latest update on cold beer carryout sales legislation. And 70% of people who are blind are unemployed. One organization in Indiana is working to solve that problem, plus much more. We'll take you inside Bosma Enterprises. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two hands. Make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm going to help the human race with my own two hands. I can comfort you Aha. with my own two hands. With my own two hands. With my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, it's been a busy week at the State House. Barbara Brozier is back with us as we go through the latest on where the bills stand. And Barbara, let's just start with the budget. This year is a long session, so lawmakers are trying to get that budget ready by the end of the month. Oh, that's right. The House and Senate will negotiate a final version of the bill in a conference committee. The Senate approved its version of a new two-year state budget this week. The budget's author praised the bill for not increasing taxes, funding the fight against Indiana's drug epidemic, and focusing on education issues. But many Democrats say the Republican plan should show stronger support for education. The controversy at the State House surrounding cold beer carryout sales is continuing after two amendments were discussed this week. Rickers, who parked a food truck next to the State House to demonstrate their made to order food, began selling cold beer from two convenience stores with seated restaurant spaces in them. This prompted the legislature to seek a change in the rules. This amendment in total simply pauses this issue by ensuring that no additional permits will be granted until the General Assembly can determine our policy in a thoughtful and deliberate manner and while allowing Rickers to continue operating under other permits they were legally granted. The House bill wasn't called for a vote. The Senate bill creates stricter rules for restaurant permits and does not allow for Rickers to renew their cold beer and liquor carryout permits. The two chambers will work out details in conference committee. A bill aimed at pharmacy robberies and heroin dealers is headed to the Senate. The bill would increase penalties for both acts, and it prevents a judge from suspending all or part of some heroin dealing sentences. It's focused on the opioids. It's focused on the heroin. It's not, it's not going uh, uh, broadly in, in, in any other direction. The Senate can send the measure to the governor or a conference committee. A bill that would give local governments control over creating needle exchange programs is headed to the governor's desk. Some proposed amendments would have required a one-for-one -one needle exchange or asked for more reporting of drug-related crimes. But those amendments didn't get a hearing. Needle exchanges aim to reduce the spread of infectious diseases by providing people with clean syringes. And Indiana could become one of nine states where the top education official is appointed solely by the governor. The Senate passed a bill that would make that the case this week. And that's another bill now that is awaiting a signature from the governor. And of course, we'll keep you updated as these bills continue moving through the state house. Developing blindness late in life can lead to many difficulties. Lindsay Wright visited a center in Indianapolis where blind people from across the country come to learn to adapt and overcome new challenges. Tina Cox could put a smile on anyone's face. She's funny, full of energy and life, 
But a battle with cervical cancer in 2014 led her to lose most of the vision in her left eye and left her with minimal vision in her right. At that time, Cox says she lost her spark. It was scary. I didn't want to leave my house. I didn't want to. I was staying with my mom after my surgery, and I relied on everyone for everything. And of course, you feel like that, you know, your world is over. People who are blind can experience depression and difficulty finding opportunities to live a normal life. But Cox eventually decided that's not an option for her. And then finally, I just decided, no, it's not. I have children, I have grandchildren, and I have me, and I've got to go. And so now I'm just nonstop. <laughs> About two months ago, Cox came to Bosma Enterprises, a nonprofit organization just north of Indianapolis. It's one of about 90 national industries for the blind agencies across the country. They're all different, but in Indiana, Bosma offers training and employment opportunities. Cox is going through extensive programs where she's basically relearning skills to live an independent life, like walking on unknown trails or busy streets. And Vice President of Program Services, James Michaels, who's also blind, says it's like school. They're here every day, they're learning how to to travel without sight. Um, they're learning how to cook a meal without sight. They're learning how to take their medications. Here in the personal management lab, it's kind of like a home simulation where you learn best how to cook and clean. And that's really important to Tina, who's kind of the chef in her house. We're going to have a lesson using the locking lid. At any given time, we have 13 to 15 clients going through our center-based program. And that's where we, we look at the whole person. And it's really important when someone's adjusting to their vision loss that they don't think of themselves as, I'm just this blind person. I've learned braille, I've learned uh, cooking techniques so that I don't burn myself. I've learned how to uh, manual skills, which is things around the home, so I can change out a doorknob now if I get a bad doorknob at home. And Cox even learned how to weave a basket, which is all about having confidence using your hands again. One of her biggest challenges, though, is learning computer skills at Bosma. My app store, iTunes store, phone. Technology couldn't be more important for someone with vision loss. Applications on smartphones and computer technology, like what Cox is using to read, can fill in the gaps with not being able to see. According to the National Eye Institute, between 2010 and 2050, common eye diseases are expected to double which means more and more people could experience vision loss. And nationally, around 70% of blind people are unemployed, which is what Bosma's largest program focuses on. Bosma helps people find jobs in the community, but it's also the largest employer of blind people in the state. More than half of Bosma's employees are visually impaired and at all different levels of the company, from packaging surgical gloves for VA hospitals to executive leadership roles, like the one Lisa Pace is in. Pace has vision loss, but worked her way up in the company from a volunteer to the director of marketing in just eight years. I have been told that when I came here and I started volunteering, that I dressed in dark colors, that my head was always down, and that it has really been like seeing a butterfly go from a cocoon into being a butterfly. Overall, Michael says Bosma's mission is creating opportunities and helping people gain that confidence, whether they're trying to find employment or are going through the training center. You are more than just your vision loss. You are a mom, you're a dad, you're a, a friend, you're uh, a person who's got you know, great hobbies, you, know, you, you have a lot of other things about you other than just your vision loss. And Cox says the resources at Bosma helped her feel like herself again. She says it's a new lifestyle, but she's only looking forward. A lot of people don't even really know that I have a vision impairment, or, you know, that I'm partially blind because I'm always just, I just hang on to someone's arm or hold someone's hand. And now it's like, don't touch me, I got my cane. <laughs> For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. Bosma Enterprises also sends teachers out into the community to help people coping with vision loss in their homes, mostly seniors. Senior Citizens is the largest growing group of people with vision loss. Last year, Bosma helped more than 500 seniors in the community. Well, there are, there are now five bald eagle nests in Bartholomew County. Their population is increasing across the state, 
and the birds are moving closer to urban areas. Columbus Mayor Jim Linup says city workers stumbled onto the newest bald eagle nest. We were looking for or scouting for, you know, a place where we could do a little bit of uh, uh, cleanup along one of our waterways and uh, and noticed this humongous nest up in the tree. And lo and behold, there were some really big birds flying in and out of it. Flat Rock River runs through Columbus, providing a food source for the eagles. Out of the five nests near Columbus, four of them are active. Indiana DNR non-game bird biologist Allison Gillette says over time the nest can reach the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, weighing as much as two tons. She says she's not surprised some of the nests are close to the city. There's just so many eagles around that there's not necessarily enough habitat for them out there. Gillette says the Bald Eagle Reintroduction Program released 73 eagles from Wisconsin and Alaska during the 1980s at Monroe Lake. 300 pairs of bald eagles now nest in Indiana. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, primary care and specialty care providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company. Fiber Internet, HD, and digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.